Um, welcome to the June town hall. Thank you so much for attending. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll introduce you to the speakers. All right. Can everybody see? Yep. Good, good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we are we are seeing the screen. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, well, my name's Taylor Bundren. Thank you all so much for attending. Um, today, we're also going to be um, hearing from my co-host, Vanessa, who is the um, communication supervisor. We're going to be hearing from Emmanuel George, who is the community action uh, program supervisor. And we also will be hearing from Renee Pardello, who is a um, longtime supporter of One Village Partners and also was on the board of directors for six years. So. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, our focus today is um, economic equity and resiliency and kind of how this plays out in our work. Um, these are two uh, things that are really important to us. And um, at One Village Partners, resiliency is one of our pillars. Um, so we're gonna be sharing a little bit more about that today, but we um, kind of define it as being able to adapt and respond to external shocks. Um, so being able to kind of bounce back from things and move forward, um, which is a really important uh, quality and something that can really transform you know, your family, your community. And we have seen this happen so much um, with our partners in Sierra Leone. We have just seen so much resiliency and growth um, over the years. Um, so we're super excited to talk a little bit more about that today. Um, and something that really ties into this as well, like resiliency um, is very interconnected with economic equity. Um, and that's kind of defined as, um, it's like a multidimensional term and is defined as the fairness and distribution of economic wealth, resources, and assets in a society. Um, and we think that this goes hand in hand with resiliency. Um, and at One Village Partners, we see economic equity as this, that our partner communities and all Sierra Leoneans, regardless of their tax bracket and their gender, should have the fairness and distribution of economic opportunities. Um, so welcome again. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, I am going to uh, reintroduce Renee. She's going to be speaking next. Um, and so, Renee, uh, thank you so much for your support over the years, for um, your service on the board of directors. My question for you today, um, and we're looking forward to, to hearing from you, is um, about how equity is one of our values here. Um, how do you think that equity amplifies resiliency with our partners and leads to thriving communities? Hi, everyone. Um, Renee here from Minnesota. It's so great to hear, see many of you. And I met a few people before this town hall began. Um, before I respond to this question, I actually have a question for you. And I think uh, Taylor has it on a slide. So I want you to think about this. What is life teaching you now about equity and resiliency? You can think about it in your family, in your community, at your job, um, maybe in politics, wherever you live, what's going on. But what is life teaching you? And since we're, we're such a small group, um, why don't you take about 60 seconds and then we'll see if folks want to share. So if anyone's interested in sharing, feel free to unmute yourself, or if you want to, you can kind of jot something down in the chat. Actually, yeah, I'd love to say something um, very short and quick. I was telling some of the other, um, other guys, but um, I'm currently in, I don't know if I can see my face. Uh, I'm currently in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And although we've got an election coming up, um, and there are a lot of crazy things happening. One thing I can say about um, resiliency is seeing how Sierra Leoneans are able to bounce back from things. I feel like 
personally, I am not the most resilient person and I would just like run away and like hit under a tree or a rock or something. But um, Sierra Leoneans are very resilient. Living here and being among Sierra Leoneans um, is teaching me that, that, you know, things can get tough, but they are very, and, you know, resilient is a big word to use, but they are really able to bounce back and to stand up for themselves, stand up for their rights, use their voice and actually speak up and be heard. Um, that's just a little segue or something I'm learning right now because I'm in the midst of Sierra Leoneans and I'm learning about them. So yeah, just wanted to share that. Thank you, Vanessa. Anyone else want to share? Yeah. All right. Am I to go? Please. Yeah, you can go. All right. So resiliency also is one of the components at the moment, One Village Partners in collaboration with MCLD, they are trying to address in Sierra Leone because we are now smelling the election flavor pretty soon, 24th June, 2023. So with that, even though series of humanitarian organizations have been raising awareness for non-violence election, but because of One Village Partner through uh, 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 the collaboration of MCLD realized that uh, peace cannot be within a day. So that is the more reason we are still resilient to organize radio uh, 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 discussion for us to send strong message to the youth then. Because most times when violence occurs in Sierra Leone, they are the frontliners. And sometimes they put their lives in danger where the, the politician will relax at their various houses or offices living comfortably. So with that, the media sensitization engaged by one big partners is somehow creating series of impact in the life of youth for them to know their right, roles and responsibility, and also how to exercise their civic right for them to exit through the election without involving themselves into any violence and also for us to track more investors and donors that can boost the employment rate in Sweden and also minimize the unemployment rate of the youth in Sweden. So that is what currently we are engaged on. Great. Thank you so much for sharing um, to both of you. Um, I'm going to move on because I know we have limited time. I, I want to say that life is one of the best instructors we have, and we get to choose if we want to learn from it or not. So thank you for sharing your learnings. So I believe, like I think many of you, that equity and resiliency are interconnected. The greater equity we have, the more thriving communities we have which re results in this greater ability to adapt and respond to the external shocks, i.e. resiliency. So who here values equity? Just raise your hands. I'm guessing everyone does. If someone doesn't, then okay, that's cool. Oh, we got a thumbs up, I love that. So, so when we move beyond valuing equity to practicing equity, it results in changes. And those changes can occur at the individual level, the family level, within an organization like OVP or other organizations at the community level and so on. So which in turn, I believe results for a greater caring for one another, a greater caring for the collective good of everyone, as well as caring for the environment, which results in thriving communities. As we know, equity is much more greater than gender. It's gender, it's ethnicity, it's race, income, religion, it's who has access to land, who has access to clean water. So let me go back to the question that Taylor asked. How do you think equity amplifies resiliency with our partners and leads to thriving communities? This was a, this was a tough question for me because I felt uncomfortable. Because I don't have any direct experience in Sierra Leone or with the communities that OVP works with or all of you from Sierra Leone on this call. I don't have any experience with you. Yes, I've been involved with One Village Partners since 2015. Yet what I would be doing now would be telling other people's stories. But seven years ago, I was comfortable telling other people's stories. You know, I was fine promoting what was going on in Sierra Leone. So what changed? Well, I believe I and we within One Village Partners, we actually move from valuing equity to practicing equity. So let me share with you an experience that 
I've had over the years with One Village Partners, specifically with the US-based staff and board um, regarding equity and resiliency. So when I first became involved with One Village Partner, and at that point it was those of us in Minnesota, um, we actually were the people creating the programming that would occur in Sierra Leone, writing up the curriculum and so, far, so forth. We worked hard, we really did. We reviewed reports from Sierra Leone and other countries where similar work was happening. We read evaluations. We really believed in what we came up with. And it was good programming. It was solid programming. And as we began practicing equity more, what happened is, is we moved towards becoming a community-led organization where power is shared, which is very exciting for me to see this happening in real time. So today, an example of how that is seen is the strategic planning is done across the whole organization. It includes the staff in Sierra Leone and in the United States, and more importantly, the voices of community members are heard and listened to in the process of developing these plans. Another example, I know you all know this firsthand, it, firsthand is, is that Sierra Leone, the staff in Sierra Leone you know, are not just paid the going rate, but they're paid the going rate for the position that you hold, which is much greater. When it comes to resiliency, One Village Partners knows when to act swiftly and when to pause and adjust. For example, the swift action and knowledge that was gained during the Ebola crisis affected how communities that OVP partners with managed the COVID crisis. So we learned, we were able to adjust, we were resilient. Today, the new programs come from input from staff and community members, not from someone like me. So as we know, we invest in people. I know that Emmanuel will be sharing examples of communities demonstrating equity and resiliency, and Vanessa will be sharing with you a new initiative focusing on the environment. So together, our stories will be telling you how equity being valued in practice results in changes in the individual level, the family, within the organization, within communities, which improves how we care about each other, the collective good and the environment, which I believe results in thriving communities. Thank you. I believe we are stronger together and I appreciate everything you all do. Thank you, Renee. Um, thank you so much. We are going to uh, hear from Emmanuel now. And um, Emmanuel George is the Community Action Program Supervisor. Emmanuel, thank you so much for all of your work um, with our partners and in the communities. Um, our question for you today is how have you seen our partner communities and community action group volunteer leaders lean into their strength and resil resiliency? And what role does equity play in that? Thank you so very much, um, Taylor. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Emmanuel George. Uh, uh, Taylor just introduced me. I work at One Village Partners as a community um, action program supervisor. Now, um, here at One Village Partners, just to let you know, accountability is one of our greatest values, which we have fostered and uh, enhanced over the, over the years. This is part of our work, and this is what defines us as an organization. At the community level, we have always modeled this, but I want to just give a clear account of what actually I'll be talking about shortly. Now, in many times, we think that um, communities, the challenge to face in planning and implementing, well, implementing specifically community projects, uh, must all be smooth. Sometimes it is not. Sometimes we feel that one particular leader is, is stepping behind. But it is not that. So it is all based on these flexibilities that I see the intersect between um, 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 resiliency and that of financial equity. Here as one village partners over the years, my work have actually seen uh, helped me to see um, uh, resiliency being portrayed by uh, various aspects, various aspects of our work, ranging from the uh, volunteer cohorts, from the communities. Uh, leaders, I mean, or ordinary people in the community, this has been resonated in various aspects. So, for our start with the CAGs, as you are seeing from the slides, in all communities, we have community volunteers, we call them community action group. These people are trained uh, leaders in the community that will help guide their communities 
to um, achieve goals that they identify as a unit. So they have been able to hold each other accountable to utilizing their uh, internal network and a relationship. They in our communities, there are various networks like um, college sustainable livelihood assets. We talk about groups like savings groups, for example, social clubs, for example, or you know, village TV and loans associations, etc. Communities have been able to hold themselves accountable to these particular networks and uh, interacting with one another to make sure that the work is being done even amid turbulent times. For the volunteers, they have led the mobilization of um, local materials and themselves to take collective action in order to achieve goals. This is what actually I will demonstrate as an example, clear example of resiliency. Now, they have also been able to leverage the power of collective action to complete challenging projects, you know, and shock. Now, like I've already said, dynamics across communities based, and because they're based, um, there are challenges that spur up during project implementations. This have been handled quite quietly by our community leaders, who some have actually risen to the task and, you know, perpetrated top uh, various challenges in the implementation of the project. In this regard, I mean, they have been able to hold themselves accountable, like making bylaws in the courts or reaching to the chief to make sure that general bylaws are being made that um, affect everyone in the community. So, 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 so this have actually helped them to be competitive in terms of um, responding to shock, like um, financial, not not accessing finance for um, the um, a whole lot of finance to make sure that projects are being done, but they tax themselves in that regard to make sure that people are contributing to a particular project challenge. So with community resilience built through our partnerships, of course, communities have learned the importance of saving for the unprecedented. For example, if I will set an example of a community called Kambama, we recently handed over a gravity water system there. This particular community have been able to hold themselves accountable to repair and maintaining their uh, projects even after one really partnership lab and left the community. What they did, they made sure, led by the CAGs, they made sure that they um, continue the collection of household contributions to save that so that if there's any unprecedented kind of damage on their water system, they'll be able to repair that themselves. Now, equal access to, to funds that creates change in a community, this will definitely take me to economic, example of economic equity in Maloma. In this particular community, they are challenged with such a divisive kind of political differences and uh, people not supporting their chiefs, etc. But in our training, we try to model the importance of respecting others' view, inclusivity, you know, respect and uh, making sure that women are involved, etc. As a result of this, they were able to create access, to get access to funds related to their projects by kind of leading the creation of a community bank account where they themselves contributed at household level added to what OVP provided, they were able to pay their free workers to construct the rice milling um, center and the construction of lacteries that they needed most. They gave voice to women, like I have already uh, highlighted, and the marginal marginalized groups. As part of the community as stakeholders, one of the marginalized guys, you know, who used to, well, physically challenge, was even part of the MSC story sharing where we were able to track how we were able to overcome that challenge of previously being held at the front to coming to the front line. Let's move on the slides, please. So thank you. Addition, in conclusion, to conclude this aspect, I would therefore want to tell you about um, the cost edging aspect of resiliency and financial equity. Now, in general, what we do as One Village Partners is making sure that what we give as part of project sponsorship or let's say by implementation or let's say hire of free workers, for example, everybody in that community has a stake in the utilization of that particular fund. Here, the opening of the community accounts actually detects that everyone should have a voice in which who is to, to, to be the signature to that particular account and who is to when uh, um, the free workers So, so um, I would therefore say we have been able to enhance um, a, a system where communities have been able to um, utilize these funds equally without any fear of favor or some particular people just um, taking hold of the resources because they are the leaders. 
across these communities. I see this as a passion driven mission where we as uh, workers at One Village Partners have been able to utilize um, the interconnectedness at the communities, at community level and individual levels to make sure that people are continuing to implement various projects amidst difficult challenges that they have been encountering over the years. I want to say thank you so very much. And this is what we call an example of resiliency and what we call aspects of financial equity where everyone is counted when it comes to utilization of resources related to the project. Thank you so very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. It was so great to hear all these really cool examples that you have seen. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to Vanessa, she is going to be sharing a little bit more. Um, and Vanessa is our senior communications um, supervisor, and um, she is going to be talking um, and building upon what Renee and Emmanuel have always already shared about. So, Vanessa, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Emmanuel, Renee, you guys pretty much covered everything I'm going to say. So, I'm going to be very short and quick, everyone. And, um, but I do want to say, following up with what Renee and Emmanuel has said, um, financial equity or economic equity, um, even though in and itself it's not a pillar of what we do at One Village Partners, but what I am seeing is that what we do and the work that we do amplifies that. That means it makes it more known in the community. It is more visible. It is more um, real per se. Um, I want to go back to what Emmanuel said. Um, my favorite story, I think of last year and this year, but I'll say this year so far, is the community of Kambama. And Emmanuel shared that story where um, they did an amazing um, tower um, for water, to provide water for their community. Um, and I was there at the handing over ceremony where we were giving their, you know, their project back over to them saying, this is yours, look after it. And the town chief himself made the statement very clear. And he said that he is actually enforcing this community-wide savings group, allowing everyone to feel like they own a part of this project, not just the men, not just the workers, not just the town chief, or not just the quote unquote important people, everyone having that fair and um, equal opportunity to give and to actually look after this project so that when OVP goes and One Village Partner goes, they don't have to rely on us and they can depend on their own resources. And it's one of my favorite stories to show how we amplify equity and amplify the idea that you know, independence is something that these communities actually have on their own. And what we just need to do is that show them that you can look after your project and you can um, be resilient, you can be strong and you can bounce back from external shocks on your own. Um, I'm gonna go really quickly um, highlighting a, very, a new project that we brought about. And this is to talk about equity on an environmental level in a, li a little bit, just as what Renee was saying. Um, so a new project that we started um, that we're doing right now at One Village Partners is the Participatory Land Use Mapping Project. And this project really empowers community to understand their land, understand their land rights, and actually understand conservation on a higher level. So what we want people and our communities to do is to actually be a part of the dialogue. Because in Sierra Leone, the deep historical injustices that you know, number one, did not give women access to land without a male relative, or actually did not even give women the ability to acquire land on their own, and so much more. Um, these things made, you know, generations as it's come about, we've seen that our communities actually don't know their land rights, whether, whether that's against big corporations, whether it's against government, they don't know their land rights to say, you know, you can't just, you know, break down our farming to build a new hotel or to build whatever it is, you know, this is their land and they also understand conservation. So what we're doing is um, ensuring that the participatory, the participatory land use ma mapping is community centers and centered and actually it's driven on the community's interest and visions, which is their land and which is for them understanding um, their, their knowledge on farming, on agriculture, on agricultural businesses. This improves food security and income. So at the end of the day, as what Renee said, is that rather than just valuing equity, we want to actually practice it. And I think this project is a really big thing that we're doing and a great thing that we're doing as practicing equity so that men and women can actually understand their land, understand their land rights. And that actually is creating 
thriving communities. Um, so that's pretty much my um, what I wanted to share. And I wanted to open it up for anyone if they wanted to add any questions or ask anything regarding what any of us says. But thank you. All right, Back I'll see you, Renee. Yeah. Go Taylor. Yeah. Um, if anyone has any questions um, that, about what we talked about today or like other questions as well, we want to take the remaining time left um, to just talk about anything that you are curious about or want to know more information on. I was curious to know, guys, when if you could tell us a little bit more about the elections going on in Sierra Leone, that obviously will have a great influence on the future here. So if someone in Sierra Leone would kind of fill us in on that, for those of us that are rather uninformed about that, that would be great. Please. So sorry, Stephen, my internet cut out a bit. I didn't, I didn't hear the first part of that. I was asking about the elections in that were are coming up in Sierra Leone. I thought that would be an ah. interesting little piece for us to uh, better understand exactly what you guys are going through in the short term. Yes, no, absolutely. absolutely. I think I I'm I'm currently in Freetown and um Emmanuel would you know those in the east and where we are will have different experiences. So Emmanuel, I I heard your voice. If you want to speak on that first, I'm I'm cool to go after. Yes. All right, thank you, Vanessa. Um, elections here. Um, well, you know, we are consolidating the peace since the end of the war. So there, there is peace from uh, coming issues when it comes to election year and processes. And as it stands, you know, the normal trend is here. The, the population feels disadvantaged, right? Incumbent feels the operation is in trouble. So, yeah, there are a lot of, there have been a few skirmishes around. Um, who wants something to change about the electoral commission or what this that when relates to the election process or what the president or the incumbent should do to make sure things appear. So it has been a kind of interesting roller coaster kind of movie. And it's just run. We have had some economic challenges, uh, some even uh, lockdowns. Well, I would say um, unprecedented conflict related to um, unauthorized riots over the few months. So it's, 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 it's right already, it's upon us, and we are waiting on Saturday, but it's not all smooth. Nevertheless, like Vanessa have mentioned, we are resilient, and we have been able to, you know, come all challenges to go about our normal businesses. And we look forward to the election on Saturday, actually. Thank you. Nabi, that was pretty much the nicest way you could have explained the election. I, on the other hand, was just gonna say, um, it, it has been crazy in Freetown, um, <laughs> and um, I personally, I think it's it's been um, eye opening. It's very, I know, Sierra Leone actually Sierra Leone is known to be a very peaceful com um, country, um, and I think there are so many deep historical things that we could go on and on about. You know, the causes of tribalism and things like that. We could go on and on, but right now, in Freetown, where I currently am, the current state is. Um, a bit unknown. We are ha having press releases after press releases from opposing parties, from the police, um, unauthorizing protests, but then people going out to protest. Um, today, there has been a couple of deaths, unfortunately, because of those protests. Um, we are, on my end of the knowledge, we are unsure if the election will take place on Saturday. People are calling for the election to not take place uh, because there aren't enough, as Emmanuel was saying, data results to showcase. I don't know the full story, to be honest. Um, but in Freetown, it's actually a bit crazy. I'm hoping for the best. Um, elections only, what, a day or two away. So I'm hoping we just continue on with it because it will be tense whether they postpone it or they continue on with it. Will the country accept the elections or are there, is there some concern about the country kind of pushing back if the elections are not... Uh, the results aren't what they were hoping for. What, what's your feeling about that, Vanessa? Um, 
currently what I am, it's not necessarily the country, it's more opposing party. Um, the current, um, the, oppos the opposing party to the current government is saying that um, they, there were early poll votes. Um, they're early voting a couple of weeks ago, last week, I think. And the issue at hand was um, they didn't have enough ballot boxes or the ballot boxes were old. There weren't the new ballot boxes. If anyone has the proper information, please jump in. But it was something along that line. And so there is fear of mishandling the votes. There is, I think, an innate fear of it could be rigged. Um, so that's, I think that's what's bringing all of this up. Lossi, your hand is up. Yes. Yeah, in addition to that, um, the, the, the bony issue that I was seeing on Black House today on the media is that the opposition party is requesting that the, the, the Electoral Commission displays data of voters and, and by and, and all. And the Electoral Commission is saying that they can't do that. They start sensitive data, they can't make that public. So they, they are also calling that uh, results from elections be counted manually, not electronically. So these are the two greatest claims, you know, that they actually um, um, want the commission to do, and the commission is not agreeing to those two. I know this is going to sound like kind of a loaded question, but it's one that seems to relate to this conversation today. Does the current government or the opposing government believe in the relationship between equity and resilience? Mm. And I'm, I'm saying that because I'm wondering if they're going to truly support the rural communities throughout Sierra Leone, where one village partner has has uh, it has in, a footprint and impact. Again, on my end, it jumped out, but whoever heard that, please answer if you, you heard that. Um, Steve, I don't know if you want to re repeat the question in a second, but I think this will be our last question for the day. Um, but Steve, if you want to repeat that, just so that we have Vanessa can hear it and also any other Sierra Leonean staff that wants to answer, I think that's a really good question to ask. I always find that when organizations like One Village Partner have an impact on the rural communities in countries like Sierra Leone, it's really mm -hmm. ideal when they have a government that supports the same philosophies and beliefs and values that they do. And so I was wondering, you know, from those of you in Sierra Leone, if you feel that the, either the current government or the opposing government believes in the relationship between what we spoke about today, equity and, relation, and, and resilience, if in fact they support that same kind of set of values. Oh, that's a really good question, Stephen. Um, I, I, I will speak objectively because I've only lived continually in Sierra Leone for a year now. I am Sierra Leonean. Um, truthfully, I do think Sierra Leone governments, when we do have the right leader, um, and Sierra Leone as a whole, I think everyone does value. Um, equity and re, um, resiliency, not every part of equity, because of course there are so many gender mishaps that are still happening. There's so many inequalities in that sense. Um, resiliency, I also do. And again, this is me saying, I think this is really 90%. And then there's the 10% um, that, are, that are very um, either headstrong in their tribalism or headstrong in their political party. But I think 90% of Sierra Leoneans generally do because 90% of Sierra Leoneans wouldn't want to see, not even 90, I think 98% of Sierra Leoneans want to see war happen in this country again. Um, so I think a lot of times we are very um, careful to be peaceful and careful to have that. Um, I can't speak, let's say, um, for, you know, Lossi and the other team who have actually, you know, born, raised, lived here their whole life. So I'll probably hand it back to the statements before we close up. Lossi, your hand is up. Yes, um, I think I want to say yes. Um, the current government actually um, is taking equity and resiliency to be a, a, something that is very much relevant in the development of Sierra Leone. Um, why I'm saying this is because over the years, we have seen the, the, the policies being put in place to empower, especially women. For example, the the, the participatory land use mapping that we just implemented, which we, we presented, is something that we, we, we try to actually see how we can raise awareness about the, 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 the roles and responsibility of each and every individual in, in the community. And that is in line with the, the customary land rights act that was produced in 2022. 
which clearly states out that each and every member of the community, especially women, have equal rights to the land they own as a community. And that actually also gave a provision to women that even when they are forming the, the land management committees, they should have 30% of women being part of that particular uh, uh, committee. And that was, as we are also seeing for the political uh, um, aspect, this Gender uh, Empowerment Act is also something that they are working on. For all the political parties, they are, they are actually, uh, I mean, asking them to have 30% of women representation in the parliament, which shows that um, he's actually believed in the equity aspect because he's actually trying to, to create that platform for women to participate in, the, in, the, in politics and, and to see how they will be empowered. And this is what one great partners we are actually trying to, to raise the flag because when we consider the MCLD, that is part of our strategic plan to see how we can actually engage civil society organizations and even the government to see how we can improve the equity aspect for women across the, 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 the country. And currently, the MCLD is actually growing in Sierra Leone. We currently have up to 12 national and uh, international organizations that have joined the, the movement for community -led development. And we are trying to see how we can liaise with the, the government and other civil society organizations to actually raise this flag to see how we can continue to empower uh, women and even uh, rural communities to be more efficient and effective in development. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for everyone who answered questions. Um, thank you for all the good questions too during the Q and A. Um, but we're gonna stop there. Uh, it's been great seeing you all and having you join us. Um, and yeah, thanks for taking time over lunch or if you're in Sierra Leone over dinner maybe um, to spend time with us today and uh, to hear about uh, equity and resiliency. So thank you all. We hope we will see you again soon. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, everyone.